The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The Lord be with you. And also you. you are great, O oh God, and greatly be praised. You have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Grant that we may believe in you, call upon you, know you, and serve you. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. 
shall bless you. The Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 11th chapter. Lord, Lord. Jesus spoke to the crowd, saying, To what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such as your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The Gospel of the Lord. You. May be seated, and we'll have a time for children. Hi, 
Hey there. So you guys, can you tell, us, tell me some of your favorite kinds of food? What's your favorite foods? Yeah. Chocolate chip ice cream. Awesome. Mint. Yeah. yeah. Cheeseburgers. Yeah. Swedish pancakes. Wow. Swedish spaghetti. I've never heard of that. Got one? No? Well, what if I had never tried one of those meals? I've never heard of Swedish spaghetti, so we might go with that one. <laughs> um, and I want you to try to convince me to try some. So what, what's so good about it? Maybe your brother. <laughs> How about pizza? Do you guys like pizza? Yeah. yeah. Okay, try to convince me to eat pizza. Why should I eat pizza? I really like it when the dough is just gooey. Gooey dough. Yeah? Got a favorite kind that's just like the best you got to have? Yeah. Taco, Taco pizza. Well, you know, I'm kind of, I don't know, pizza is kind of ugly looking. I mean, it's got all the toppings on the top and you see them and then they bake and they bubble over. Is it really that good? Should I just close my eyes and try it? Okay, oh, yeah, I will. Well, you know, Jesus was talking to people who, he was getting them to try something, only it wasn't a food. He was, he was trying to get them to try God's love and peace, and they were coming up with all kinds of excuses, just like I was, you know, oh, it's kind of ugly looking, why would I eat ugly food? So they were coming up with excuses, and that's why he says, see, blessed are the, you don't have to be smart, the smartest, or the most um, uh, experienced, or anything like that, to try God's love and peace. And here were people who were really smart and really experienced, and they were giving really reasonable excuses, but they were missing out on something really good, like missing out and trying pizza just because you don't like the way it looks. And what that means for us is that God's love and peace is for us, and it's not dependent on whether we're super smart or successful or good-looking or popular or funny or athletic athletic, that we can, all we need to do is try. Try to receive God's love and peace. Um, just like I need to try a slice of pizza. See what it's like. And that God's love and peace is available regardless of what we can or cannot do. And that's the good news for today. So I'm going to ask you to pray with me. It's a repeat after me prayer. Dear God, Thank you for Jesus, who reminds us that we do not earn your love and peace, but receive your love and peace. Amen. Thanks. You can have a seat. I'm going to warn you before we do our sermon, the message today that it involves technology, and so a little prayer that it all works out <laughs> would be good. <laughs> I have a question. Have you ever messed up? I mean, like really screwed up. And you know it the moment you do it. And you feel exposed or humiliated or angry or just angry with yourself, you know? Ah, why did I do that? Maybe you spend money you don't have. Or you did a dessert that breaks the big diet commitment you made. Maybe it's a little more 
serious to your health. You take one too many drinks one too many times. Maybe it's emotional. You talk about someone behind their backs rather than confronting them one-on-one -on -one about the hurt that they caused you. I'm sure you can add to the list. Even though this wasn't a reading, I want to start there. I want to start at the beginning with a story about Adam and Eve. See, Adam and Eve broke the one rule that they were given in paradise. One rule. That's the only law they had. Do not eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge and evil, for surely on that day that you eat it, you will die. That's a pretty strong rule. But they did eat from the tree. And they didn't die physically. But there was a death of a type. A death of who they were before they ate of the tree of knowledge and evil. See, whenever we screw up, when we mess up, there is a death to the identity we had before the mess up and a new normal that evolves afterward. The story of Adam and Eve began what I like to call the fully human experience. We are a good creation. God created us, and it was good. We are a good creation. We are blessed people, blessed to love. We also have the knowledge of choice, and we can mess up. And that's the beginning of this fully human experience in which failure and messing up and shame and the dealing with it and and. All of this became as much a burden as a blessing. A blessing because these things can also propel us into a types of uh, success and transformation and, and daring greatly. So what happens when we do not understand our actions? What happens when we, like Paul, do not do what you want, but do the very thing that you hate? God shows up. I want you to look at this video of a three-year-old who messes up, and her dad shows up. A hundred times. And then when she was uh, all painted blue, did you think that you should have stopped painting her with nail polish in your room on the carpet? I turned it off, but I was thinking, I know, I couldn't get it off. So you tried to get it off, but you couldn't? No, it do off. Now, where are you allowed to use your nail polish? Outside. Outside. But when you painted inside, why did you do that? She told you to? Yes. Okay, do you, does Barbie know that she could have ruined your carpet and your bed and all of your blankets? Yes, she told me to. I said it was a horrible idea. She didn't listen to me. So you told her it was a horrible idea? And, and she said a quarter times all of the time. All right. Well, all my Barbie say, be, keep saying that. All of them do. Oh, all my goodness. So, who should get in trouble? Should Barbie get in trouble, or should Sophia get in trouble for using the nail polish in the house? Oh, my dad, they, they want me to paint on the nails. Okay, but should you get in trouble, or should your Barbies get in trouble? Me, but my, my, my dogs always, they, they want me to paint the nails. 
But it's not a good idea, is it? They tell me to. I understand, but next time they tell you to, are you going to let them, uh, are you going to listen to them? No, I'm going to say no, and they'll say yes, a whole new time. But you're going to keep saying no, right? Yeah, and they'll going to say yes. Okay, but are you going to paint your nails in the house again and paint your Barbies in the house again? No, he's going to say yes. Okay, but are you going to say no? All right. Well, next time we paint our nails and our Barbies in the house, we're just going to have to throw out all our Barbies. What do you think of that? And then they're going to say no. They're going to say no? But, 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 but then they're going to say yes hundred times. time. Mm, okay. A, a lot of times they do that. Okay. Well, I think you learned your lesson, and I think you're not going to paint your Barbies anymore, right? But you're going to say what? No, but they're going to say yes. But you're going to say what? No. Good girl. I love you. I love you. <laughs> when we're ashamed, when we've messed up, we want to hide. We want to blame others. Barbie made me do it a hundred times. I'll say no, but she said yes. We want to change the history. We want to change reality. So we hide the bottles, the evidence of binge eating. We make up excuses to cover our shame, our pain, and then the cycle continues and perpetuates. As you know, we've been in a series on the book of Romans. We'll be looking at chapters in Romans until September. And right now, this is a powerful, this is halfway through the book, through this letter that Paul is sending to strangers. And I think it's a powerful testimony to hear Paul, the great mission developer, 20 years mission developer, monumental communities in Christian history that he developed and, and began saying, I am a conflicted person. Do you remember the first time you may have read from Romans? from Romans 7 in particular, the first time you read that crazy sentence, I do not do what I want to do, I do what I do not want to do, and it goes on and on. And have that realization that I'm not alone. I'm not the only one who struggles. That Christ Christians aren't perfect. That churchgoers have as many internal conflicts of fears and anger and shame and strife as a non-Christian. To truly understand what we read from verse 15 and on, you need to go two verses back to verse 13. Just before... His famous quote of the I do not do what I want to do, I do what I do not want to do. Paul is having a debate about sin. Paul says the law tells us good things to do. But the law also teaches us bad things to do by being the law. Basically, what he's saying is, God created us to be good. And then the law says, do not covet. Well, I did not know what coveting was until the law told me not to covet, and now I know what coveting is, and so I covet. So is the law good, or is the law bad? It's kind of like when you tell a kid not to do something. Don't paint your nails in the house. And of course, that's just what they do. 
So he's asking, like I said, is the law bad? And the answer comes in verse 13, which I'll read from the translation in the Message Bible. Romans 7, 13. Does that mean I can't even trust what is good, that is the law? Is good just as dangerous as evil? No, again. Sin simply did what sin is so famous for doing, using the good as a cover to tempt me to do what would finally destroy me. By hiding within God's good commandment, sin did far more mischief than it could ever have accomplished on its own. Paul's making a point here that the law, that following the rules, is by no means an agent of salvation. The law will not save us. That we are saved by grace alone, by God's grace. That sin can pervade and twist the law. That the law is good and the law is just and it can be twisted. We are not to pursue the rules. We are to pursue over love. We are not to pursue the rules over pursuing love. For we have a God of love. A God who asks for the truth. Does not run from our shame. Does not run from our embarrassment. Does not run from our lists of excuses and our blaming. Because God sees us and God knows us and God loves us and wants us to be transformed through our strife and our mess-ups. To be transformed through that. And it goes all the way since the beginning of our story with sin. We're reminded of the power of God's grace. Grace is not a word that just came in the New Testament. It's in the Old Testament, too. And Adam and Eve is an amazing story of God's grace for us in the human experience from the very beginning. See, Adam and Eve realized that they were naked and they went and they hid. And then God showed up and then God found them and God acknowledged that there were consequences for their mess up. That now life would be difficult. It would be more human. It would be more real. And then God made them very real clothes. God took care of Adam and Eve after their mess up, after God shows up. God took care of them. God met them where they were. God did not wait for them to get their act together and do it themselves. God met them in their hiding. God met them in their shame, in their nakedness, and restored them to wholeness and gave them a new normal. For now they would live life after the mess up. That it would be a new way of being. And then God, it says in Genesis, God was with them everywhere they went. They were not abandoned. You can't hide from God. And we're not alone. We may hide, but we are also found. And messing up has consequences. Grace does not mean that there is no consequence for our mess-ups. We will live life after the mess up. When we stumble and fall, we skin our knees, and it hurts. But God shows up and is a healer who cleans the wound, restores us to wholeness, for we are saved by such grace. And as a church in transition, God shows up for us too. See, a church is like a family. 
we have a family history and there are stories we like to tell and then there are stories in our family history that we don't want to talk about and these hidden stories those are the things that hurt us in the future because churches are made up of a system of connections and interconnections. It's made up of complicated and sometimes simple feelings and emotions and relationship. Church is all about relationship. God gave us the law. When I say, the, when I say this, I mean right down to the most basic Ten Commandment law. The first part of the law is about our relationship with God, and the second part of the law is about how we can be in good relationship with each other. God gave us that so that we'd have something to know, to, to help us find our way in relationship. But the law won't save us. God's grace does. So as your intentional interim pastor, I want to help you through this journey. Through pains, through hurts, through celebrations, through shames, through resentments. Through the things we don't want to deal with. So that Messiah can have the best future possible. Released of the, these pains. I want you to know that I'm available for a listening ear. I'm available for a story to tell, for a sorrow to share, a grievance or a grief, and a hope for the future. God shows up for our relationships, and church is made up of relationships. God shows up for our church in transition and shows up with saving grace. Amen.
Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Called together in the Spirit's embrace, let us pray for the mending of God's world. Humble God, lead your church in the way of service. Prosper the work of campus ministries and young adults in global mission as they raise up leaders to serve the world. Lord, in your mercy. Cultivating God. Bless and encourage all who work the land to feed your people. Give them joy in their vocation. Shower rain on crops and health on livestock. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Holy One, you command peace to the nations. Give peaceful hearts and discerning minds to world leaders and citizens alike that all who suffer violence and hunger come to know the fullness of life. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Gracious God, you bid the weary to come to you for rest. Renew energy for bone-tired people. Support our brothers and sisters who were burdened by grief, loneliness, and illness, especially Al Fellows and Jan Schnaff. Lord, in your mercy. God of everything, you have compassion for all that you have made. Show our congregation what mercy looks like in our own community, that we become faithful partners in your ministry. We pray especially for safe travels for the seven women traveling to Minneapolis for the women of the ELCA Triannual Conference. Lord, in your mercy. God of life, we give you thanks and praise for all the people who have blessed our lives, for saints among us whose steadfast faith has strengthened ours. We remember especially Mary Bylenberg Hill. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we lift up prayers of thanksgiving for the family and friends of the marriage of Mr. Scott and Mrs. Megan Jackson, and for Dan Carlson doing better. Lord, in your mercy, all these things and whatever else you see that we need, we entrust to your care through Christ our Lord. Amen.
Merciful God, you open wide your hand and satisfy the need of every living thing. You have set this feast before us. Open our hands to receive it. Open our hearts to embrace it. Open our lives to live it. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs> the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, Almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with all the choirs of heaven, with the church on earth, and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, you have brought us this far along the way. In times of bitterness, you did not abandon us, but guided us into the path of love and light. In every age, you sent prophets to make known your loving will for all humanity. The cry of the poor has become your own cry. Our hunger and thirst for justice is your own desire. In the fullness of time, you sent your chosen servant to preach good news to the afflicted, to break bread with the outcast and despised, and to ransom those in bondage to prejudice and sin. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to all to eat, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper, he took the cup, blessed it, and gave it to all to drink, saying, Take and drink. This cup is the new covenant of my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ died, Christ risen, and Christ will come again. O oh God, send your Holy Spirit, a, your advocate, to fill the hearts of all who share this bread and cup with courage and wisdom to pursue love and justice in all the world. Come, Spirit of freedom, and let the church say, Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. 
The meal is prepared. All are welcome to share in this meal of forgiveness that Christ offers you today. We will commune by intinction. You will receive a wafer and you may dip it in either the dark liquid, which is wine, or the light liquid, which is grape juice. And there are gluten-free elements available. Just let the server know. You may stand or kneel at the railings, and the ushers will let you know when to come forward. Come, let us eat.
Please stand as you are able for the post-communion blessing. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you always in his grace. Amen. Jesus Christ, host of this meal, you have given us not only this bread and cup, but your very self, that we may feast on your great love. Filled again by these signs of your grace, may we hunger for your reign of justice, may we thirst for your way of peace, for you are Lord forevermore. Amen. You may be seated. invite you to look over the announcements in the lavender colored messenger looks like you have an announcement all right Thanks. Now, you may have noticed some blue t-shirts around. We have youth heading off to camp uh, right after church, 9.30, I believe. So, actually, soon, now. <laughs> so, I invite all of our youth to come forward that are going to Tom Camp Tomashinga and our drivers um, just for a blessing and safe travels. So how many are going this year? 17? And who are our drivers? All right. Well, I don't have anything formally prepared, but I want to pray a blessing and a prayer of safe travels for you all and invite the congregation to uh, join me in this prayer. So let us pray. Gracious God of traveling mercies, we pray your blessing upon all of these young persons who are traveling a long road trip to have a week of fun, a week of learning about you, singing songs they'll remember forever. Lord, we pray for their camp counselors as they are excitedly preparing to welcome you. We pray for their drivers that they may have focus and may safely deliver and return from this trip. We pray your blessings upon each person's family as they may worry during the week. And may they have calmness in heart. Lord, we pray all of this, and we know that your spirit is among us, and your spirit goes with them. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Thank you. Let's get out of the seat.
Now I invite you to stand and receive the blessing. Now may the power of God strengthen you. May the love of Jesus Christ heal you. And may the wisdom of the Holy Spirit guide you now and forever. Amen. Guided by the gospel, we go in peace, serve the Lord.